Thank you very much for the introduction. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Portuguese, you know, and, uh, and so it's always a great honor to be back and tell you a little bit about the work that I'm doing in my laboratory with my students and my collaborators. <clears throat> and uh, one of the areas that I have in the, in the lab is, is really the development of brain-machine interfaces. And so today I'm going to present you some uh, very recent work. It's still, I still don't have a lot of results, but I think that the, the issues involved in creating this somatosensory brain-machine interfaces are very, very interesting. And uh, uh, I always say that the, we are launching problems and we expect the next generation to solve them. So this is a great forum for some of you that are looking for problems uh, to effectively uh, look into this in more detail because there's a lot of interesting problems. Anyway, um, first of all, I would like to, to acknowledge that this is the work of one of my PhD students, Lin Lee, and um, the outline is going to be, I'm going to present the problem first and then I'm going to talk about signal processing. What we, and a lot of my talk is going to be about signal processing methodologies. Um, because this particular uh, somatosensory uh, interface requires, in fact, new signal processing. And I'm going to present some uh, preliminary work with the animal experiments and then some simulations. So what is the, the, what is the brain-machine interface? This is a general architecture. And uh, I'm going to focus my attention on, on this slide on motor uh, uh, BMIs, and the idea of a motor BMI is really to bypass the body. As you know, the brain uses the body to interact with the environment, but due to disease or injury, many times the brain is imprisoned by the body. So this is an avenue to effectively try to um, to establish a communication channel directly from brain activity to external devices, uh, robotic uh, devices, that can interpret and decode uh, the intention of movement. Um, if you look at this, of course, there is many, many details on how to implement this, technological details, you know, biocompatibility details. But I would say that the very important uh, aspect of all this architecture is the signal processing because the, the, the information that exists in, 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 uh, in, in the brain is distributed and so we have to find ways of effectively, you know, um, uh, finding structure and quantifying structure in spatial temporal uh, signals. If you look at this, you see that there is a feedback loop. In fact, the individual um, uses normally is visual system to effectively um, close the loop between what the computer is doing and what he wants to do. Um, and we have found out that this interaction, this feedback, is crucial. The more feedback or the, 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 the more modalities we can bring to the feedback, I would say that the better are the chances that we can improve the channel bandwidth from this decoding problem. And so, giving you this idea, then I'm going to focus on what I'm going to present to you. The idea is, can we improve the realism of the subject's interaction with the BMI? Okay, so of course, if, if, I, if I use my body, you know, I can hand, you know, one object, feel them, weight them, and things like that. However, if it's a robotic device that is doing this, there's no way that the subject will be able to feel and to get all this information that is cues that are extremely important to effectively control uh, <clears throat> and change the, the control mechanisms, not only in the, in, the, in the musculature, in the peripheral nervous system, but also in the central nervous system. And so what we would like to do is exactly is to open up a new uh, avenue to, to bring information to the subject. And so this is the reason why um, I call this, this talk a somatosensory uh, BMI, because what we would like to do is uh, bring back to the subject 
the feel of, for instance, touching an object. And so, how can this happen? All right, so I have to give you a little brief introduction about neuroanatomy and neurofunctionality. But whenever you touch a, a, a finger, for instance, there is a tonotonic, tonotopic um, representation of old body in the thalamus, in a certain part of the thalamus. So that means that in a, a particular point of the, the thalamus is associated with, you know, sensation in the left, uh, you know, pinky. Okay? And so the idea is, but the sensation is not, uh, is not perceived in the thalamus, but is perceived in the, the primary sensory area, in S1. All right? So the person, I mean, when he feels that something is touching the, the finger, it feels it in S1. But I know that first the information is routed to a part of the thalamus, and then what, um, and this is very important to me because what I would like to be able to do is electrically stimulate this particular part of the thalamus such that I create in S1 a spike train that will mimic the spike train that the individual will receive when its left pinky is effectively touched. All right? So the idea is that I like to create here a stimulator, an electrical stimulator, such that I'm able to recreate a spike train that mimics the strike, spike train that the individual will receive if his finger was touched. All right? So this is the problem. How are you going to do it? What do we know about the system? Very little. <clears throat> That's the first thing. The brain, we know a lot of things about the brain, but there's much more to be learned about the brain. So, what are the features of these spike trains that are created in S1? We don't know. Moreover, we can expect, because of brain plasticity, that if I keep on stimulating a certain part in S1, the response is going to change. Okay? The transfer function from the thalamus to S1, I also don't know it. All right? So, if I don't know anything, why am I trying to do this, right? <laughs> this is the beautiful thing about engineering. And those of you that are engineers, you should understand the importance of feedback. Feedback is an amazing idea. Because I really don't know what the system is, as long as I, if I tap a signal, from which I have an error, I can work with the dynamics of the error to effectively control the full system. All right? So this is exactly what we are trying to do here. Although we, do, we know very little about the, the, the basic uh, physiology. All right? We are going to use control theory ideas to be able to see if we can develop this. And of course, adaptive control appears as a, 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 very, a very interesting approach because, you know, it is optimal in some sense. I can make it work in real time. And if the, 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 the plant, and the plant for me right now is the, is the transfer function between uh, the thalamus and S1, if it changes, this system will be able to track it. All right? So this is what I would like to do. And inside the adaptive control, we, we really are investigating this idea of adaptive inverse control as the, the, the methodology to accomplish this. And the reason to use adaptive inverse control is exactly that the, 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 the plant and the controller are always under feedback. All right? So this is exactly what uh, the idea of the adaptive inverse control is. Basically, what you like to do is you present here um, the desired response, and the controller has to basically invert what the plant does to this signal such that the output is going to be equal to the input. And you have here this global feedback that allows you to do. So as long as you can model the plant and track the, plant, uh, track the plant's uh, changes over time, the controller will try to track that. All right? So this is what we thought about. We wrote the proposal. They, they like it. All right? And here is the reason why I'm here presenting you some results. So adaptive inverse control has been around for many years. However, there is a fundamental difference 
from the way that we apply the adaptive inverse control in engineering and what I need here. Why? Because the brain cells, the neurons, don't give me outputs that are real numbers. There are no real numbers in the brain. Okay? When you put the sensor, you measure a voltage, that voltage is a real number over time. Neurons don't work that way. Neurons spike. So they give us many spikes over time with a certain structure. And this is called a, you know, a spike train. And so what I like to do is exactly work with spike trains instead of with real numbers on this topology. All right? So this is the added difficulty of working with the brain. So in a nutshell, you know, this is basically what we like to do. I like to use electrical stimulation with very short pulses, about 0.1 uh, milliseconds duration. But, you know, there is a leeway. I can go from 0.1 up to 2 milliseconds. The other variable that I have is the amplitude, okay? And eventually, also, the bursting. But we are not there yet. So for me, the only thing that I'm going to, to, to do at this point in the game is I'm going simply to try to control the amplitude of these pulses such that when I stimulate the, the thalamus, I can obtain in S1 a spike train that is uh, similar in some sense to the spike trains that the natural stimulation of the finger uh, produces. And of course, if you like to do that, and since I have this big system, you see that the big problem is really an inverse model. So I have to somehow model the difference between, you know, from the, the stimulation to the spike train. All right? So let me now start giving you a little more details. This may be a little too much detail for some of you, but, uh, but we have to solve all these problems. That's the point that I'm trying to make. So the time resolution of my simulation is about 100 milliseconds. And what happens is neural, uh, neurons spike sparsely, all right? So in S1, I would say that the average spiking rate of a neuron is about 10, um, uh, 10 spikes a second. But you know, if I have a, a 0.1 millisecond resolution, that means that I'm going to have very long uh, sequences of zeros if I just do sampling of this signal with a 0.1, uh, with a 0 .1 uh, uh, millisecond resolution. So I'm, that means if I want to model some, somehow the, 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 the relationship between, you know, uh, the thalamus and S1, I'm going to have huge models. All right? And those of you that know modeling, you can't have models with a thousand parameters and work in reasonably. So what we can do, we can, we can bin the data, but if I bin the data, that means I count number of spikes on a certain interval. And if I do so, then I will never be able to, uh, arrive, to, to keep this time resolution that I want. Uh, I can smooth the spike train somehow. The numbers change, but still, I need a lot of numbers. On the other hand, if I look at the structure of this signal, what counts is when the neural spikes occur, the action potentials occur. That's the only thing that matters. So you see, if I, I, can have, I'm, can, I can span one second of data and I may have four or five spikes. That means that I only need to work with the timing of four events. But for that, I have to work with spike trains, the structure of spike trains themselves. I cannot use any of the other things that we normally do in, in, in neuroscience, and that I, my lab also did for the, uh, the motor BMIs. We have to work with the spike structure, spike train structure. <clears throat> what is the problem? The problem is, if I give you two spike trains, and I ask you, add these two spike trains. I don't know how to add spike trains. Multiply spike trains? I don't know how to multiply spike trains. So how am I going to do signal processing spike trains, right? If I don't have the underlying metric structure that we have in Euclidean space. That is the problem. And um, 
we know enough about point, spike trains and point processes. If I assume that there is, uh, uh, um, you know, a probability structure in in these spike trains, and so I, they are stochastic processes, and I, in fact, I know that this function that uh, is called the conditional intensity function effectively describes the statistical structure of a spike train. Okay? Um, therefore, you know, one good indication is to try to use somehow the intensity function. In, my, uh, in, in our work. And this is basically what I just said. You know, the problem is that if I would like to apply signal processing theory to this type of, of objects, the spike trains are objects that are not numbers, um, I have to somehow create at least an inner product structure. Because you know, most signal processing algorithms in fact exist in an Hilbert space. All right? So this is exactly the problem. How can we do that? And um, what we did is, this is the definition of um, what we created is an inner product between two intensity functions. So suppose that I have two spike trains from neuron i and neuron j, and what I like, I define this function exactly as the, as the inner product of uh, the two intensity functions. And inner products, if I go uh, you know, to the appropriate uh, uh, metric space um, with a, uh, a Borel metric, this is equivalent to an expected value of the integral of the, of the two uh, spike trains over time. And this inner product gives us really a family of cross-intensity kernels that depend obviously on what is the the particular intensity function uh, that I use um, for my uh, analysis. We are not the only ones that looked at this. Uh, Spiegelman, in fact, in 2007, proposed also a spike, uh, a sp what he called a spike kernel, but it created from, from, uh, from bin data, and so it's not appropriate for the, what we, I want, because I really would like to have the timing information on the spike train. One of my students, Antoni Paiva, um, proposed exactly the, the, this, uh, the cross-intensity uh, function, this integral uh, that I defined before, as, as, a, as, a, as a, um, another family of kernels. And it turns out that if I assume a Poisson assumption for my spike trains, what means is that this intensity function um, becomes instantaneous, that means the, the, the dependence on the past disappears. And so it turns out that this simplifies, the Poisson assumption is a very interesting sim uh, uh, simplifying assumption for this uh, type of, of objects. And this is still a linear, uh, a linear kernel on the space of spike trains, but I can come up with more complicated um, uh, elements of the, of the family, and I can put here a kernel uh, whose arguments are exactly uh, the, the intensity functions that I obtain. And this is exactly the, 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 the NCI kernel is the one that I'm going to use for, for, for this study. Okay, so this is a nonlinear, um, is nonlinear related to the space of intensity functions. Now, of course, this is nice mathematically, but if I want to do this from real data, I have to have estimators. So how can we get estimators for this quantity? It turns out that it's not that difficult. And this is one of the beautiful things about this, all this approach, is that I can impose an exponential decay on each one of, the, of my spikes, and I can create an estimator of the intensity function uh, for the Poisson process very simply, and therefore I can approximate um, or come up with an estimator of the, of the cross-intensity uh, kernel by, you know, since, since the integral is a linear operator, I can do this, and I can, if I put an exponential here, this kernel is basically a Laplacian of the differences between the times of the events. Okay? And so this is, uh, the nice thing about this expression is I can, from real data, exactly estimate the intensity function. 
Once I, I have the intensity functions, then I, I told you that I can use a kernel, a nonlinear kernel. We are a positive definite kernel. We are using the Gaussian function. And so this is exactly going to be uh, the kernel that I'm going to propose and, and use in this study. Okay. If I have multiple, multiple spikes, I can use an independence uh, between spikes, and I can therefore come up with a, a multi-channel um, NCI kernel by this product of, uh, of, of, um, of Gaussians in each one uh, of the pairs. Okay? Now, what this does is a very interesting thing, and this, this is what this figure means, and I'm going to kind of translate the figure for you. What this, is, this kernel is doing is effectively looking at the full structure of the spike train in creating a function in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space defined by this positive definite function. So you see, you went from the full structure of, this, of the spike train in time to create the mapping to an Hilbert space. And that's exactly what I like. Why? Because Hilbert space is an, has an inner product structure, and I can apply my algorithms. My favorite algorithm in signal processing, I can apply in Hilbert space. All right? That's exactly what we did. Well, but I like still do linear models in space of functions. This is not data. They are not numbers. They are functions. So I like to create now models that work with functions. Okay? And uh, fortunately, in another part of my life, I had a student, Wei Feng Liu, a very bright Chinese student, that was exactly doing this. He was effectively trans translating the least mean square algorithm, the recursive least square uh, algorithm that we use in, in an adaptive silver processing exactly to work in reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Of course, the reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces that Wei Feng was interested in was just uh, uh, Gaussian all over the data. And here, we are going to work with our spike trains. But the beautiful thing about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces is that they, are line, they, they have properties independent of the kernel. So I can apply, without any modification, the algorithms that, that uh, Wei Feng developed for this work. And I'm going to just give you a brief idea for you to see how we can do that. So the interesting thing is that, <clears throat> let me go back. So the, 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 the interesting idea is that, you know, I'm mapping in a nonlinear manner some object to an Hilbert space. And so as long as I work with algorithms in this space that are in the product, I can apply what is called the kernel trick to effectively do the calculations with the data. All right? And that is the key thing, the reason why we are interested in this. And the question is, you know, those of you that know adaptive signal processing, you know probably this equation. This is the simplest first equation uh, that we give in adaptive signal processing and tells me that I have a system that do, these parameters are updated proportional to the gradient. The gradient, if I use a linear model, is nothing but the multiplication of the, of the particular input to the parameter and the error that is created by the structure. And so what we would like to do is implement this now in my space of functions, all right? And it turns out that this is possible. And it gives us a, a very interesting uh, way of um, creating nonlinear models by incrementally approximating the nonlinearity, all right? So this is different, although once the system is trained, is giving me something that is very similar to a neural net, the way that I'm creating this system is very different from neural nets, okay? Because I'm, every sample has a contribution to the nonlinearity, all right? So I'm going to sk skip what is a reproducing kernel over space. The most interesting thing is this property that tells me simply that I can know the value of a function at the point if I take an inner product with my kernel at the point, centered at the point, with the function. 
Okay, so this is what is called the reproducing property, and this is the beautiful thing uh, about this type of spaces. So I'm just going to go briefly on, on how we are going to do the calculation. So the LMS algorithm, least mean square algorithm, is very simple. I start with an initial value for the parameters. I compute an error with the previous weights. Then I update the, my weights with multiplication of the input with the error. And it turns out that if we, if we select a kernel that is an inner product of the mappings from the, the one space to the other, then what this algorithm translates to is the, basically the same thing. I start with some initial condition for my weight function. Now this is a function that exists in the Hilbert space. I compute an error in my input space, that is the difference between the desire and the inner product of the previous weight function times the mapping of my current sample. And then I update my, 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 my weight function exactly in the same way as that equation gives me. And it turns out that I can, you know, I do this iteratively, and that means that my weight function can be built incrementally from data with a sum that increases with number of samples. That is the only problem. So this, this algorithm gives you a filter, if you will, that always increases with time, okay? And if I have, I would like to do, uh, have a graphical picture of what this is, this is nothing but a radial basis function network, if I use a Gaussian kernel, that grows with the data. The beautiful thing is that these parameters in the radial basis function network that we normally adapt through uh, least squares here are just the errors. So this is very simple. I just measure the error, and those errors are exactly these parameters. All right? So now that I know how to do linear regression or filtering in a space of functions, then what I have to do is simply now, instead of working with, with, with uh, data from the reals, I'm going to work with my spike trains and use the non, um, uh, the NCI kernel to effectively do the mapping, all right? So there is a lot of detail here. Uh, and of course, if I want to now work with multiple channels, I already told you that I'm going to, to, to my kernel is going to be a product of kernels, and I can really solve uh, a multiple input, multiple output decoding problem uh, in the RKHS, according to these formulas. So I'm going to give you some examples. Um, this is real data. So what we are going to do, this is a rat experiment. So what is happening is that the, the, the animal was, was stimulated first with a thwack in the finger or in the paw, and spike trains were measured in S1, okay? And uh, then what we did is we, we, we stimulated the VPL with, um, with, uh, with a, a pulse, and we place 16 uh, microelectrode arrays in S1. That is our data, the recording. Uh, and so basically what I'm doing is I'm stimulating in VPL, and I'm recording there. So basically what the variables in my microstimulation are simply the, the amplitude level of my stimulation. As I told you, I, I fixed the pulse duration. is not 0.1, but it's 0.5 milliseconds. And I have three values of, of amplitude. And so basically the problem that I need to solve is that given that I have the inverse problem, given that I have this microstimulation here, I would like to find out how I, I can predict what are the spike trains that I'm going to measure there, okay? And I'm going to do this by creating a decoder that receives the, the spike trains and output gives me uh, things similar to uh, the stimulation that I'm creating. This is the data for, I told you that we were working with 16 electrodes. Uh, here we did some uh, analysis and we am just going to show uh, the four most important uh, neurons. This slide does not show very well. In red, you see the pulse that we would like to predict, okay? And these are 50 microamps, 75 microamps, and 100 microamps. And we did multiple stimulations. I think that here it's 80. And what I did is I um, simply um, 
or order the stimulations, the presentations for display purposes by the time to first spike. And as you can see, what happens when the stimulation is, is low, there is a huge dynamic range of time between, you know, sometimes a given neuron, you know, fires right after the stimulation, some other times much, much longer, so there is a, a huge uncertainty when the amplitude of the stimulation is small. But when I increase the, the amplitude of the stimulation, you see that the dynamic range changes. And in fact, when it changes, I can get, start getting better and better um, um, predictions of the pulse that I like to create. Okay? So I think that about 75 microamps is enough for this work, model to work. We compare our results with other results in the literature. This is my approach, our approach. The spike kernel that I told you about by Spiegelman gives us a very similar result. The GLM, the generalized linear model that is also very common in the literature, is much worse. And the reason is that this GLM is about a thousand dimensions, so it's very difficult to, 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 to effectively um, uh, parameterize it appropriately. But the big advantage of our kernel with respect to spike kernel is that we have very few, many fewer parameters. In fact, we only have the kernel size of the, of the Gaussian. And uh, this is just to tell you, if I change the kernel size in my, in my model, how the, the performance changes. This is performance in terms of, um, of uh, our metric for performance. I think it's, I should be here, I'm sorry. Uh, the metric for performance is, is simply um, the mean square error and MAC. Um, and so you see that there are certain uh, neurons where performance is very good across all the kernel sizes. Some neurons um, are pretty poor uh, for the modeling um, uh, across all the kernel size. So it's, these are good news. That means that the kernel size is not finely, needs to be finely tuned. Um, the other thing that we have to find out is how does performance change with the number of channels that I use for my modeling. And we found out that, in fact, four uh, channels are sufficient to give us fairly good robust models. OK, so that means that I know how, you know, that this methodology seems to be working, right? So how can I go to the adaptive first control? All right, so this is the overall design. So this is basically what I showed you in my first slide, you know, what, this is our controller, this is the, the, the transfer function from thalamus to S1, okay? And what I like to be able to do is, if I want a desired response in S1, I input it here, my command input will be the desired response, and I hope that what I measure in S1 will be similar to that. And in order to do this, obviously, I have to identify the transfer function that I just showed you the results for, and then I have to build my controller. It turns out that there are two ways of doing that. I don't want to get into details. The one that uh, we decided to use is this filter uh, LMS algorithm that instead of identifying P of Z, identifies directly P1 of Z, the inverse model. All right, but this is just a detail. And uh, so I have to first from some training data, I have to estimate P minus one, okay? And then online, I'm going to get the parameters of the controller, and also online, I can then update and track changes in P, this model, all right? Um, I can do this with spikes, now I told you how. So instead of working with real numbers as we normally do in the engineering, now I can work with spike trains everywhere. And it turns out that when I go to the Hilbert space, this algorithm, in fact, becomes much simpler. <laughs> and that's the beautiful thing about this, is that this now becomes, again, very similar to um, uh, uh, the algorithm that we use in adapt inverse control, because now I'm working with, instead of with numbers, I'm working with functions, but the equations are exactly the same, okay? And since the KLMS, is able to compute all these, um, these parameters updates using the inner product, I can effectively implement all of this in, uh, in, uh, in real time, okay? 
I still don't have results for that, but uh, I am going to show you some examples of uh, some synthetic simulations that we have done in the lab. Uh, I created a, a model of um, leaky integrating fire neurons. There's a large model, 135 neurons. Uh, the parameters of these neurons were chosen for the somatosensory area. Um, and what we did to mimic the stimulation um, is I, I, we created a, a, a field model, let's say, as a first layer that basically is telling us, you know, if the, a given neuron is far away from the particular point where I stimulate, then I'm going to have different uh, uh, amplitudes of stimulations. And, uh, and so this is, uh, I think it gives a lot of, of, uh, of um, realism to our stimulation. But, but, but basically what is important is this set of 135 neurons. And I'm, going to, I'm presenting you um, the response of this 135 uh, LF, uh, LIF uh, neural models. Each layer of this is a different stimulation. And you, you see that there is variability, as, in the, in the, in, as we find in, in biology. Uh, but of course, when you stimulate, most of the times you have quite a bit of activity. So these are the conditions for, my, for the experiment. The training set is six seconds. I need a training set, as I told you, to, 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 uh, f to come up with the inverse model of between the, um, thalamus and S1. And I'm going to use two seconds of data um, for my test set. And at that time, I'm going also to adapt the, 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 the controller, um, C. And I'm also going to adapt. Uh, the P minus one. This example here is no adaptation of P, okay? And as you can see, this is the target firing pattern that I wanted to create, and this is the uh, target, um, the, this is the, the spike train pattern that, I, that my system gives me, and this is the evolution in time um, to this stable pattern. And uh, our similarity measure for spike trains cannot be mean squared error because I'm comparing to spike trains, so we come up with, with a similarity metric in, in, in a, you know, that is a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, it basically is a, the, 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 the inner product projection. And um, again, what I did is I, I, I'm showing you the similarity as a function of the number of, of, um, of neurons. Some neurons don't spike at all, and of course, so um, you have no information here, but you see that when the neurons start spiking appropriately, then the, the similarity metric is very nice, okay? So these results um, give us confidence that this is a, 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 an interesting methodology. Then we did other things. We changed the the, the synthetic model, uh, and we would like to see if we could track the changes in the neural system with our method. And uh, of course, I would like to have a measure of how, am I, how much am I changing my neural model, and for that we use this spike trigger average, and this was a spike trigger average obtained before um, with the original circuit and after uh, the circuit. And you see that there are major changes, in particular, in one of the dimensions. And this dimension is the one that is uh, closest to the stimulation. Just to show you, so you see here the adaptation of the system. And so in the beginning, so I changed the neural system, the synthetic neural system. And so my, my, I have to update P minus 1. And the controller also has to change. And as you can see, you have uh, uh, you know, an adaptation, uh, adaptation response of the controller. The performance is not as high as before. And the reason uh, that this happens is that 135 neurons is not enough to give you universal properties. That means even if the, if the controller was perfect, the neural system may not be able to produce spikes in the same way as before. Um, but as, as you can see, we still have neurons that perform, per, produce very well, perform very well. Okay, so 
this kind of uh, wraps up the results, the preliminary results that we have. So what we, uh, what I told you is we propose this online methodology of training a controller to adapt, to track a system, a neural system, and adapt the parameters of the controller at the same time in feedback. And we did all of this using the spike trains structure. So we are not working with real numbers. We are working in space of functions that are mapped from the spike trains with this trick of the, of the, of the producing kernel over spaces. All right? So this is um, very different from what you see in the literature. These are preliminary results, but we are very hopeful. In particular, Lynn is very hopeful because she wants to graduate. <laughs> But, uh, so I think that this is, this is very in interesting, you know, because it really gives us um, the real value, I think, of bioengineering. You have to understand the neural system. You have to bring your mathematical techniques to the level that is necessary to explain the system. A lot of times, we just go in and get our best algorithm and apply it to any data. Not a good idea. There are no universal tools. Therefore, you always have to understand the nature of the data, where is information, and make the changes in our methodology such that you effectively can extract that information in the best possible way. All right? So this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention.